Hi everyone, today we're going to work through a classic physics problem where we have a circular loop of radius r and at the bottom of the loop there is a particle moving horizontally with a speed of u and the question is to find the condition on u, in other words the minimum speed required in order for the particle to complete one full loop and come back to its starting point. So to start off with I'm just going to add some things to the diagram. In particular we are going to consider uh, the state of the particle when it's reached some arbitrary position on our circle. So let's say the particle has made it up to this position um, somewhere towards the upper right of the circle. Um, we can add a couple of useful things on there. We can draw on its velocity vector, which I'm going to call v like that. The velocity is tangential because the particle is moving in a circle. Um, we can also introduce a coordinate in the form of an angle to accurately specify where exactly the particle is on the circle. To do that I'm going to draw a radius from the center to the point where the particle is and define that angle in the middle to be theta. And it would also be helpful to consider the forces acting on the particle. Um, so we would have well definitely a weight acting downwards. So let's draw that there. Uh, let's call that mg where m is the mass of the particle. I haven't specified uh, in the original problem statement that it has a mass of m because the final answer won't depend on it but we can just introduce m as the mass and then we'll have the normal contact force between the circular loop and the particle itself which is going to be acting in the radial direction because well it's a normal contact force it has to be at right angles to the surface itself and um, we are making use of the fact that the angle between a tangent and a radius is 90 degrees so if it's a normal contact force it has to be acting along the radial direction towards the center. So let me just label that as n for normal contact force. So one useful thing to do um, would be to figure out the speed of the particle after it's reached some particular angle theta, right? Because it's going at speed u at the bottom, but because it is moving upwards, it's losing some of its energy. And so it's going to be slowing down as it gets towards the top. So it would be useful to know how that speed actually depends on the angle. We can do that. Um, by considering the conservation of energy. So the initial total amount of energy, if we define the zero point of gravitational potential energy to be the starting point of the particle down there, then the energy was initially purely kinetic. And so the total energy was a half mu squared to start with. By the time it's made it up to this arbitrary angle theta up there, it still has some kinetic energy. It's got half mv squared worth of kinetic energy, but it's also got some gravitational potential energy, which we are going to have to add on. So that gravitational potential energy, of course, depends on the height of the particle above its starting point, so purely the vertical part of the displacement. Um, you can split the vertical displacement in this case into two parts. So um, going from the starting point to the arbitrary angle theta, um, well, your particle has firstly moved up to the theta equals zero position. So it's moved up uh, vertically along this red line, which has a length of r because it's the radius of the circle. Then it's additionally gone up this red line that I'm adding um, sort of on top of our weight arrow there. And it follows from trigonometry that because we have another radial length uh, here, let me add another red line there. We've got another radial length there. Uh, if you consider this right angle triangle, then the vertical part of that is going to be r sine theta. So the vertical displacement from the starting point at an angle theta is r plus r sine theta. You can factor out the r, and then we turn that into a gravitational potential energy by multiplying it by m and g. And so that GPE term becomes mg times r times 1 plus sine theta. And although we have we have drawn the particle at the top right of the circle, you can confirm that this still works even if the particle you know, has only made it to somewhere at the bottom right, because then your theta will be negative, and so your sine theta is also negative, and so you get a height um, which is less than mgr. So because we're interested in how v depends on theta, um, let's just make v squared the subject, and we get v squared is u squared minus 2 gr times 1 plus sine theta. Conveniently the masses cancel out. So that's going to become very useful 
later on, but let's first consider what else we can learn by considering the forces acting on the particles. So let me just write down forces. And because it's moving in a circle, there must be some net centripetal force acting towards the center of the circle. And it's a standard result that uh, the centripetal force has to be equal to mv squared divided by r, where r is the radius of the circular motion. I'm not going to attempt to derive that here, uh, just quoting it as a, uh, a standard result. But the idea is that your net radial force has to be equal to mv squared over r in order to maintain circular motion of radius r. And so um, what are we going to equate that to? Well, we have an n, a normal contact force acting in the radial direction. So we just put that there. But we also have a component of this mg, this weight force, acting in the radial direction as well. So we're going to have to add on something. Now, let's just think carefully about how to <clears throat> resolve your weight vector um, appropriately. If I just draw on in blue on top of that weight arrow there, and then you can consider a right angle triangle where you make one side like that and another side going along the radial direction in such a way that there's this uh, 90 degree angle in there. Then you can see by considering the big red right angle triangle that this angle at the top of the triangle has to be 90 degrees minus theta, just from angles in a triangle adding up to 180. Um, and so if you want the radial part of that blue triangle, you've got to do mg times cos of 90 minus theta, which is the same as mg times sine of theta. Cos of 90 minus theta is the same as sine of theta. So we just add on mg sine theta by resolving our weight vector. So why is this useful? Well, it's because we're trying to require that the particle does a complete loop. In other words, the particle never actually loses contact with the circular sort of a track that it's on. So if it never loses contact, that means the normal reaction force um, never becomes zero. So one approach to this problem is to set the normal force to zero. In other words, see where the particle would just lose contact with a circle and make sure that that doesn't actually happen. Right. So we'll see, we'll make that a bit more concrete as we as we work through this. But for now, I'm just going to note that it loses contact, um, particle loses contact with the circle whenever the normal reaction force becomes zero. That gives you the condition from your force equation, um, just the, the previous line mv squared over r equals mg sine theta. The m's cancel again conveniently and you get the condition v squared is equal to gr sine of theta. So we're basically saying that at the point where the particle loses contact, if it does lose contact at all, then this equation is true, v squared equals gr sine theta. So now what you can do is combine this equation from energy, it's called equation one, with equation two that came from considering the point where the contact force becomes zero. Let's say one and two, we can just equate them with each other because they both have v squared on the left. So we get that gr sine theta must be equal to u squared minus 2gr times 1 plus sine theta. Um, if we get u squared on its own, we can move all the other stuff uh, to the other side. Combine the sine thetas together, because we've got gr sine theta there and gr sine theta there as well. In total, you get u squared is equal to gr, and then you've got a 2 from that 2 and that 1, and then you've got 3 sine theta terms as well, which go into your brackets, so 2 plus 3 sine theta. So the interpretation of this equation is it's saying that if you want your particle to just make it to angle theta and then lose contact with the circle, then you need to have the initial speed u, which is given by this equation. Now let's consider how the right-hand side of this varies with theta. And in particular, let's think about the maximum possible value of the right-hand side. Um, you're going to get the maximum possible required value of u squared when sine theta has its maximum possible value. Maximum possible value of sine of anything is one, or any real number um, is one. Um, so we set sine theta equal to one, and we come up with the condition that u squared is equal to five times g times r. So how do we interpret that? Well, that's saying that the position on the circle which requires the most speed to reach is the position where sine theta is one. Sine theta is one implies that theta is 90 degrees, which is the top of the circle, right? So it's pretty intuitive. All, all this is really saying is that the hardest point to reach on the circle is the top of the circle. 
and we've derived an expression for the speed needed to reach the top of the circle, which is the square root of 5gr. What would happen if we were going at a bigger speed than that? So let's say u squared was bigger than 5gr. Um, well, in that case, in order to have this gr times 2 plus sine 2 plus 3 sine theta thing, in order for that to be equal to something bigger than 5gr, then sine theta would have to be bigger than 1. But we've just said that that's not possible, right? So if you're going at a speed such that u squared is bigger than 5gr, there is no solution for sine theta, which means it never actually loses contact, right? So the condition to get a full loop, um, you'll get a full loop if your u squared is bigger than 5gr, because basically then you don't get any possible real solution for theta and it never loses contact. So there you have it. The answer to our original question is that the minimum speed required is the square root of 5gr. Um, in the next video, I am planning to cover this problem, but with a rigid body of finite size rolling around instead of a particle just sort of sliding around. We'll take into account the moment of inertia and see how the moment of inertia uh, affects the result that we've just got. So if that sounds interesting, then I will see you again soon for that next video.